Look, Ryan, have you ever won on a mold of four? No, but I know you have because you bring it up every chance you get. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Playing With Power podcast, the podcast where we talk about all things CEDH, EDH, and Magic the Gathering. I am your host, Ryan. And I'm your host, Zach. And today we're going to be talking about level up moments in CEDH, specifically mulligans, when to mulligan, how to mulligan, why, and much more. All right. But before we go any further, I want to talk quickly about our sponsors. They are TCG Player, Dragon Shield, and Patreon. When you purchase your cards and accessories, be sure to buy them from TCGPlayer.com. They give some of the best prices on the internet, and you get to support local game stores in the process. When you receive that product, of course, make sure to put it in Dragon Shield accessories. They are the best in the business when it comes to quality, and Playing With Power has been using them to protect our stuff for years. Finally, uh, this content all comes from the support of viewers like you over on Patreon. We have all kinds of benefits for our patrons, including Patreon meetup days, uh, Discord access, entry into our webcam tournaments and leagues, and a whole host of others. Uh, the links for all of these are in the description below, so consider supporting us today. And of course, every episode we shout out one lucky patron, and today's patron is Alec Beer. Thanks for your support. Thanks, Alec. Uh, before we jump into today's podcast, I'd like to talk to you about Tier 1 Con. Playing with Power will be at Tier 1 Con in Copenhagen, Denmark. Tier 1 is hosting a CDH tournament with over $5,000 in prizes. It's August 13th through the 15th, and we hope to see you all there. Absolutely. I can't wait to see you all there. It's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of stuff going on there, so be sure to join us if you can. And if not, we'll catch you on another thing. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into today's topic, and that is our leveling up series. Uh, today, we're going to be talking specifically about mulligans. So the leveling up series is going to be a series, as it states, where we're going to be talking about multiple things over multiple podcasts. They're going to be peppered out. Through, they're going to be peppered throughout the next couple of months or whatever. But today, we're going to start off with number one, which is the beginning of the game, which is mulligans. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, as Zach mentioned in the very beginning here, about everything from when and why and against specific decks and how you want to do it and we're just going to go through the mulligan process and hopefully help all of you out there learn to better mulligan uh, as you're going into a cdh game so let's just start from the very beginning so zach take it away with with our beginning topic which is just when and why you would mulligan yeah so mulligans are obviously outside of like choosing your deck it's like the first decision you make in any game of magic and I think specifically in CDH, your mulligans matter a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that goes into them. So, like, you know, what your deck does, what you're trying to accomplish. And basically, you want to try and find the right hand uh, for each specific pod, each matchup. Now, CDA or EDH just being a singleton format, you're going to get a lot of different hands. You know, you're mm -hmm. not playing, you know, normal... 60 card playing four ofs with everything so you have a bunch of redundancies with like the same card so specifically you're trying to find i think generally most uh decks are just trying to find a good mix of lands ramp and interaction just like baseline and so that's what i look for in any opening hand really and then it goes up from there uh depending on which deck i'm playing yeah, I definitely know that when you first start playing EDH and in being in a singleton format, the variety or the variance, as you say, can be so unbelievably wide. Uh, it's a very common thing to say in the casual space to say, oh, I've got lands and spells. I'm good. You know, and you don't actually <laughs> go very much deeper than that. But in CDH, you actually have to think a lot harder about what cards you decide to keep in your opening hand and whether or not you need to ship those things back. The proverbial lands and spells comment doesn't always work. Yeah, exactly. Like, sure, you have five lands and two spells you can cast on turn three and four. I'm sorry, Chief, but that ain't going to cut it in CEDH. No, you know, it's not. You, got, you have to have actions on turns one, two, and three. You know, you have to be a relevant force in most most pods. You know, you have to, you have to show up to play, basically. Yeah. Not just sit there and play land go. Yeah. So talk. let's talk a little bit more in the specifics of when and why you mulligan. So when you're looking at an opening hand, uh, what are you trying to think about when you're deciding whether or not to ship it? Sure, yeah, the baseline <clears throat> lands and spells is no longer valid. But uh, you said something like, you know, interaction and stuff like that. What specifically 
are we looking for? Um, are there things that we need to consider based upon the deck we're in? Are there things we need to consider in turn order? Talk a little bit about what we are really specifically looking for in our opening hand. Yeah, so number one for me would probably be specifically what deck I'm playing and which decks I'm playing against. So one of my favorite decks is Blood Pod. So that really matters a lot on what opening hand I'm going to be keeping against my pod. So if I'm playing against a couple of like fast ad nauseum decks, then I really want to try and find a rule of law effect, like super bad. Mm -hmm. uh, rule of law will just stop my opponents from storming off super quickly, allow me to catch back up, and then execute my, my game plan. Um, other decks, um, more specifically, say you're playing an ad nauseum deck, right? You want to keep a hand that, you know, finds your ad nause, that ramps you out to your ad nause by, like, turn three or something like that. Or, or a hand that, like, protects your ad nause so you can, like, wait a little longer, you know, find the right time to fire it off. Um, another, another big, another big thing for when to choose, like, specific, like, choosing which hand you want is your turn order. Right, a turn one Mystic Remora with like Mental Misstep backup, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you have that hand going fourth, that hand is not usually very good. Like Remora is going to be fine, but you're not slowing your opponents down with a turn one Remora, stacking them out from playing their uh, Mana Rocks, you know, punishing them for doing that. So generally, like you know, like hands like that, like I, I ship back. Um, and, of course, like, turn order matters a lot. You know, I think one of the last podcasts they talked about, like, win percentage, depending on where you're at. And yeah. so, like, when you're when you're in, like, fourth and third in, tur in turn order, your win, percent win percentages go down dramatically. So, when I'm in, like, one of those positions, I'm trying to find a hand that will either just outrace my opponents straight up or slow them down so that I can catch back up. And that matter matters a lot, of course. Mm -hmm. So... From a uh, why you would mulligan something away, <clears throat> let's say hypothetically, I am playing a Jessica Ishai. Uh, it's a semi proactive deck, uh, and it's got, you know, it's got three lands, it's got a uh, Fluster Storm, it's got a Ristic Study, and it's got, I don't know, a Talisman in it. Is that something that you would keep knowing that you're on the proactive side looking to? you know, we're going to be doing something like an Underworld Breach combo. If that is something you keep, why would you keep it? And if it's something you'd ship, why would you ship it? Uh, let's see here. So you said three lands, Ristic Study, Talisman, three. and a Fluster Storm. Uh, and a Mystic Remora. And a Remora. So that hand matters a lot depending on turn order. If you're going first, I think you snap that hand off all day. It's great. Turn one Remora is awesome. And then, like, you have follow-up plays into, like, Talisman and stuff like that if you draw, like, your fast mana. Now, if I was, like, say, going third or fourth, I'd be a little more hesitant with that hand. Uh, ramping out on two is not generally very good when you're going third or fourth. You kind of want to have, like, that Mana Crypt or Mox Diamond in your hand to, like, really go fast. Hmm. So, I think that hand specifically... Uh, would be a turn order based thing, not necessarily what you're playing against, because that hand generally is good against just about any deck. Fluster mm -hmm. Storm is going to be very relevant almost all the time, and there are more. It's just great. Talismans are fine. Ristic Studies are great. Um, so yeah, it's more of just like turn order, and I guess also what you're playing against as well. If like you're playing against like really fast Ad Nas decks, or if you're like in against a, like a Stacks Pod, that hand I think is awesome. Because you have your two, one of your two best grindy engines of just drawing cards until you can just you know fi find a way out of like a stacks lock. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a very very interesting hand for sure. Yeah, the reason that I pick it is because that you have number one Jessica Ishai. You know, uh, there's a couple of different avenues you can take with Jessica Ishai. Number one, you can try and power out the bird super early and let people mm -hmm. kind of pump it and make it a threat. Another thing you can do is try to go for something like a breach line. And if you'll notice, nothing in that opening hand was any sort of out or combo execution or anything like that. And, you know, depending upon where your seat order is, as you are saying, there could be, depending on what you decide to play. So, like, if you're in first in turn order, I'm, you know, I'm pretty certain that you're slamming down a Mystic Remora, right? Oh, 100%. Um, 
But if you're fourth in turn order, are you just playing a blue source and pass for the potential fluster storm? You know? Yeah, if you, if you like put a gun to my head, you have to keep this in turn order, fourth position. Yeah, you just lay and go, hold up a fluster storm, and then turn two, you get to play Talisman into Remora. And mm-hmm. then that accelerates out your Remora so you can keep it around longer. Um, it's not the most amazing play, but it's like fine, you know. I don't, I don't think I'd ever be unhappy going Talisman into Remora. Okay. Um, yeah. um, so let's let's actually dive a little bit deeper into that. You know, depending upon your seating position and depending upon your turn order, you're saying either T1 Remora if I'm in the first or second positions. But if I'm in third, fourth, I go T1 Land, hold up Flusterstorm, T2 Talisman into Remora. Um, is there a point when you would just ship that back? Because you're saying this is a very average hand. This isn't a fantastic hand, but it's also not a hand of seven lands. So is there any yeah. situations where you say, you know what, this just isn't good enough and just ship it back? Oh, 100%. I would not keep this hand if I was going third or fourth. I would instantly mulligan this. The The thing with CDH decks is your card quality is super high, right? You have a bunch mm-hmm. of fast mana, you're playing wheels, you got Mystic Remoras, and on top of that, I think what a lot of people forget is that you have two card, one or two cards in the command zone. So effectively, essentially making your hand size plus one or plus two. Which is huge. And mm-hmm. so, realistically, like, the first mulligan is free. Your second mulligan, in my eyes, is free. You know? Like, going to six is not that detrimental. Going to five and lower, it starts to get a little sketchier, especially. but depending on, like, what deck you're playing, you know, you can come back from it. Because, like, if you go to a hand of five, you can easily get land crypt twister, and then just reset everything and be ahead on board with your mana, and then go from there. So... With that hand specifically, I mulligan it every time in third or fourth position. First or, first position, I snap it up. Remora on one's awesome. Turn to uh, position two, still casting Remora is still awesome. You got two players behind you that can feed your fish off of their opening plays. So so yeah, hands like that are, I think particularly, they, it matters what turn order you're going for for a hand like that. Hmm. And I think a lot of people don't really think about turn order when they think about their mulligans. Um, they're not really looking at, well, you know, seat position one or two versus three and four, because like you said, that that hand, without changing any cards, went from an amazing hand to an average hand. And another thing to consider also at the same time is when you have these hands and you're looking to possibly ship something back, like you just said, this you get a free mulligan in multiplayer formats. So EDH, all of these, they get a free mulligan. So you get a free seven. So that leads into another really good question. So how, what, the best word I could always describe is greedy. How greedy can you get with a mulligan? Um, is there certain metrics around uh, getting greedy? Are there times when you can't get greedy? Uh, talk to me a little bit about the greed factor when it comes to mulligan. How aggressive or conservative should you be with your mulligan decisions? <laughs> greed 100% of the time, in my opinion. In all <laughs> in all honesty, if, you're, if your deck is capable of going very quickly, you know, with your Adnos deck, some quick Underworld Breach line, like, you can get extremely greedy with your mulligans now it's like stacks decks you have to mulligan because you're trying to find specific pieces so you kind of like as quote get greedy with it you know when you're trying to find specific specific cards but you know in just your generic just like bunch of mana rock stacks you're playing wheel of fortune time twister windfall the any anything with those like types of cards in it you can get super greedy with all of your mulligans you know, just find something that... Because, like, going turn one twister twister effect is insane. Because mm-hmm. not only are you accelerating, accelerating your game plan, you're refilling your hand, but you're also disrupting your opponents, which is massive. There are so, so many times where, you know, you go turn one land crypt twister, and then your opponent draws seven, and they go, see you guys next game, because <laughs> yeah. they just drew all lands or, like, no lands. <laughs> And, like, their good opening hand went from, this is, okay, I'm going to keep this, to, I don't do anything now. And so, basically, effectively, you basically kill a player in some some scenarios. So, yeah, I think you can get extremely greedy with your mulligans. Especially when cards like Dockside Extortionists exist, and, like, wheel effects. Like, you just accelerate anything that you want, really, with with those type of cards. 
And this definitely, it appears to lean more on the, you know, proactive style of deck where you, like you said, you're talking ad nauseum strategies, uh, yeah. decks that run wheel effects in a certain degree or density that they have a reliability of seeing it. Um, are there decks or archetypes, if you will, that cannot rely on the greediness of mulligans? Is that something that you really, that really isn't uh, sweeping across the board when it comes to the deck you play? Yeah, so I would say probably control decks. Uh, I myself don't have a lot of uh, experience playing control. I, I lend myself more towards proactive and stacks. Uh, but I do, I do know that control decks cannot get particularly greedy. Every card in their hand matters a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to be hitting their land drops you know, when they can. They want to get their, their engines online, but they also need to be able to stop their opponents. So if they have a hand of, like, three lands, a rock, and, like, two counter spells, uh, yeah, uh, and, like, something else or whatever, like, they can't ever really mulligan that. Um, but also, like, it, it's weird, though, because, like, every, every deck is different because you know what's in it. Your opponents don't necessarily know, like, what flex slots you're using, things mm -hmm. like that. Your pod matters, turn order matters. It all It all just comes together into one just, like, soup of information that you need to pick out the right details in order to make the correct decision. Uh, so, yeah, control decks can't really mulligan too aggressively. Proactive decks can get super greedy. Stacks decks need to assess what they're playing against and try and find the right pieces. That's why that's why I, that's why I say like the first couple mulligans are free. Going to six is not too too bad, and then you get the get the chance of finding the right cards you need for each specific matchup. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing for people to take away when it comes to mulligans. I know a personal level up moment for me was saying to myself, I'd rather keep a great five than a mediocre six. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I have said, oh, I really don't want to go and ship two cards away because this hand is okay. But then I, I had to push myself past that. I had to get rid of the... I'll see you guys turn three because at least it's not five cards uh, style yeah. of thinking, which, you know, persists from a regular EDH slash commander or I guess non-competitive commander scenario moving into competitive because, you know, lands and spells. I really don't want to go down to five cards. You know, no one really gets online till turn three. Anyway, that doesn't happen in CEDH. People are online turn one. And you really can't afford to see people turn three just for the sake of keeping an extra card. So I found myself mulligan, uh, performing my mulligans a lot more aggressively and shipping away, quote unquote, keepable but mediocre hands in favor of hopefully a much better hand or a much more aggressive hand. Or if nothing else, a hand that just plays to my strategy a little bit better. Um, and that's been a really, really huge level up moment for me personally. So I really liked also what you said earlier um, about saying, well, what about pod composition? So one of the things I definitely want to talk about is relation to your deck against the rest of your pod. How do you or how would you tell people how to mulligan against a specific type of deck or decks at your pod? That's a good question. Um, let's see here. So it matters a lot what your game plan is versus whatever you're playing against. So for instance, say I'm on an aggressive Adnaz strategy. We have a control deck at the player. We have another proactive deck and then we have a stacks deck, mm -hmm. right? So generally what I'm just looking for with, my opening hands is I'm just trying to go fast. I want to get out there, but get get my combo, my Adnaz cast before the control player has a chance to set up, before the stacks player has a chance to set up, and basically try and outrace the other proactive deck. On the other side of that, you can uh, shift to a different strategy of saying, okay, I want to try and combo second this game. I want to let the other proactive, aggressive deck try and do their thing first, get stopped by the the, uh, the control player, and then try and combo off, or like bounce a critical stacks piece to my uh, opponent's hand, and then try and go off. And honestly, going trying to combo off second is probably 
one of the best things you can ever do in a pot of CEDH. There's there are so many times when you try and you know you go pedal to the metal. Somebody has a force of will. You've burned you know six cards out of your hand. And you're just sitting there going draw go draw go, and then uh, two turns later somebody else goes off because everyone else has used all their interaction sort of thing. Now there are mm-hmm. definitely times when you go for it. You know, because, like, there's going to be a percent, uh, a large percent of the time where, like, they just don't have it. And it's like, whoops, I had Nas on turn two, and then I won. Uh, mm-hmm. So, against, like, a pod composition like that, you know, it just depends on what, what you want to do with your deck. How fast you want to try and go off. Now, say, um, you know, say you're the, say you're the stacks player in that pod, right? You're definitely trying to find a rule of law effect, right? You want to you want to shut down these proactive decks because there aren't any like I'm trying to think of like I can't think of any combos where you can get around a rule of law effect. There are not a lot of them, and so uh, yeah, or if so, they're just so much harder to pull off. Yeah, exactly. Like mm-hmm. Blood Pod gets around rule of law with their birthing pod lines, but. That takes a lot of setup, and I think like seven mana or something like that without mm-hmm. birthing pot on the table. It's a lot or of mana. You can, yeah, you so, could uh, chain it, pack it at somebody's end step, and then Thassa's Oracle on your own turn. You can do yeah, that too. Yeah, exactly. exactly. There are ways to get around it, but it, it takes a lot more doing and a lot more all-in sort of thing. So getting a rule law effect out to slow down the, the quicker opponents is extremely, extremely good. Mm-hmm. Um, getting out like certain stacks pieces, like... Say you're playing against like a Jira deck and an Edric deck, and they're like, "Well, Spirit of Labyrinth is insane against these two decks." So, <laughs> Spirit of Labyrinth, go! And then they just sit there and go, "Go, past turn." You know, they can't do anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, it's it it, it it really comes down to like, what what strategy you're trying to employ and who who is trying to stop you and who you're trying to stop. Really, you know, uh, you need to obviously know your deck, like. I say that, but I constantly look at my deck list while I'm playing. Because <laughs> I'm, Dude, a, I'm don't a dirty... give away our don't give away our secrets, man. Oh, you're We're right, all sorry. experts at this at this yeah. game. What are you talking about? Yeah, I've memorized every deck and every line yeah. and how it wins. Uh... Playing with power totally doesn't look up their deck lists in the middle of playing all the time. Never happens. <laughs> Never, not once. <laughs> So I, I definitely agree that your mulligans are super important in consideration of who is at your pod. I will give a couple of examples of my personal uh, experiences with this. I was playing a Chromatana. A Chromatana is a stack stack. It is a win conless stack stack, meaning you win by turning sideways you attack there is no specific combo that finishes the game so a chromatana has a whole bunch of hate bears in it and ways to get those hate bears i was against a joyra deck an edric deck and some other deck anyway so but i knew that i had two decks whose whole basis of closing out this game was getting their commander based draw engine on the battlefield I was last in turn order, meaning that there is no reality where I'm going to stop somebody's Mystic Remora or something like that or something along those lines. I would have to rely on somebody else to disrupt that. And I knew that position and my mulligans reflected that. I kept a hand that did not have what I wanted from like, you know, it had like a hate bear in it and a dork in it, but it, it didn't have the hate bear I needed. But what it did have was a creature tutor in it and i kept that hand based upon the fact that i could go get a spirit of the labyrinth be able to play it on turn two and their engines could not get going their the joyra and the edric engines just couldn't go until spirit of the labyrinth was gone i specifically made my mulligan decision as the stacks player going last at the table knowing i could fetch spirit and play it on turn two I'm thinking about these turns, turns ahead. You know, I'm not thinking about what my turn one play is. I'm thinking about what my turns two, three, and four play are, and then rewinding and going backwards and basing my mulligan decision upon that. Yeah, potential hot take here, but I think Stacks is the hardest archetype to play in CDH Because you have to be thinking about what your opponents are trying to be doing and basically reverse engineer everything for your side. And so... The mulliganing for stacks hands in particular matter, I think, the most out of any deck. 
Because you're trying to do very specific things against your very specific opponents. Versus just like, I'm going to go turn one Soul Ring, Grim Monolith turn two, uh, Adnaz. Ugh, I did it, you know. Versus mm-hmm. like, well, I'm playing against two decks that use their commanders to draw a lot of cards. So I probably want to try and shut them down. Mm-hmm. So I mulligan a couple times, find a way to get Spe- a Spirit of Labyrinth or uh, Effect and then get it, cast it, and then stop my opponent, slow them down, and then develop my game plan more. Uh, absolutely. And it didn't just have to be Spirit of the Labyrinth. So a yeah. good another good example is if I was earlier in turn order, I would have actually fetched up Adranath Magistrate. So mm-hmm. the fact that I was fourth, uh, going forth in the pod said, I'm not going to be able to land my Adranath and be able to hit him. I instead have to go land a Spirit let them put their commanders on the battlefield for all I care, and then land my Spirit of the Labyrinth, and basically just let their commanders sitting there doing nothing. So, but it all started with the idea of, okay, what does this look like in my turn order? What does my pod composition look like? And how am I going to be able to make sure my opening hand can execute my plan accordingly? And if it doesn't, I've got to ship it back. And that's very important. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, there are there are a lot of a lot of a lot of decisions to be made. It's funny. CDH is the probably one of the most complicated ways to play this game, and you're already making like five or six decisions before Steven even plays a land. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. your your mulligans matter so much in this format, mm-hmm. and the fact that you can get you get one for free, which is awesome, and then you already start with multiple cards basically outside of your hand in the command zone can let you just keep aggressively mulliganing down to, to find what you need when you need it and and then execute your game plan from there. Yeah, and I think that's actually a very uh, overlooked part of Commander is you don't start with a 7-card hand. You start with an 8- or 9-card hand because you yeah. have your Commander. So playing something like Rograk Silas or Rograk Tebish means that you always have something to cast on, on turn one. You can always cast Roger and always have something to use. And then the rest of your mulligan can be used to exploit Rograk. Maybe it's something like Culling the Weak or whatever else it might be. Maybe it's something like Springleaf Drum, so to be able to tap it, or uh, Paradise Mantle. But you always have that eighth or ninth card in your hand, and those can also affect your mulligan decisions. That's why Thrasios and Timna have been so popular for so long. Curving out perfectly with huge mana advantage, with, with huge advantage engines, is always been such a mainstay of this format. You know, turn one slash two Thrasios into a turn two slash three Timna is pretty much always a good play. It just always is. Uh, I agree one hundred percent, and that's uh, that's one thing I haven't even talked about yet. Was actually just like forming your game plan around your commanders as well. You know, mm-hmm. f- part part of your mulligan, so you know, you get to you get to incorporate that into your first few turns of the game, um, which ma- can matter quite a bit uh, mm-hmm. depending on what strategy you're going for. Especially if like you know you're playing like a Golos deck, right? And you're trying to get a go- cast Golos on like say you go turn one Vault, turn two Golos, go get your Besaju, and then you just have uncounterable Adnaz later on in the game. Mm-hmm. Like that's a hu- that's a huge part of like that decks uh what it's trying to do is get a besage you out so you can just like then cast your adnaz and so getting golos out on turn two is going to be pretty insane most games and that's mm-hmm. uh, it's also like a very proactive deck so like that's one thing about like proactive decks though in general i'd say like you can just like keep a hand not really care too much about what your opponents are doing as well and just accelerate your own game plan and be like stop me otherwise i'm gonna win the game uh, you know sort of sort of thing yeah, and I definitely think that goes into uh, owning what your role is at the table. Um, mm-hmm. So you said control players have to mulligan a certain way, and stacks players have to mulligan a certain way, and proactive players have to mulligan certain ways. Um, it, it's all having to do with the fact of not just who you're against, not just where your turn order is, but it's also what role you play at this table. You've said it a number of times now already. I'm a proactive player. I'm just going to send it. You know, that's that's your role at the table. I am the person to stop. I'm not the person stopping someone else. I think a lot of people actually mix that up frequently, thinking, okay, well, I've got, I'm, 
I'm a proactive player and I've got this chain of vapor and this snap and this mana drain in my hand, I'm absolutely going to keep this. This is really heavy interaction. Except for you're a proactive player. Who are you trying to stop? You know, let the control player stop the other proactive player. Let the stacks player stop the other proactive player. It is not your job as a proactive player to stop other people. Knowing your role inside of your pod is going to be very instrumental in deciding how you should mulligan. Don't keep Chain of Vapor, Snap, and Mana Drain if you're a proactive player. Mulligan until you can get that fast mana that can burn out into your engine, whether it be Adnaws, Peer into the Abyss, maybe it's something like Corvold where you go do a whole bunch of value. Know what you're supposed to be doing, what role you're playing, and that also greatly helps influence your mulligan decisions. Yeah, exactly. I would call that probably baseline, you know, knowing your knowing your role. But then there's always the exception to the rule where, you know, you're play, play, say you're playing against two other very fast proactive decks, your third or fourth in turn order. I would probably keep that hand, honestly, because it would help stop my opponents from going off, give me more time, and eventually maybe even help like the control player catch up or something to help stop your opponents uh, faster. Because you can't always rely on trying to go f especially especially when turn order matters so much you mm -hmm. know like it, when you get to your turn three you know you've already had two and three players ahead of you have their turn four and that is huge mm -hmm. so being able to 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 pivot when you need to pivot is another like i'm gonna save this for another uh podcast i guess another quote level up moment mm -hmm. if yep. you will <laughs> so when you talk about pivoting Tell me about when you should be able to do that and how your mulligans will change based upon that pivot. Because knowing a role is one thing, but you're saying even if you're a proactive deck, sometimes you don't always take a proactive role. Talk to me mm -hmm. a little bit about that and how your mulligan decisions could change based upon that. Yeah, so it, that so when you when you pivot like this, I think it all comes down to like once again turn order and pod composition. Right, that's that's two huge factors for for whenever you're mulliganing, and so you know if you're like last in turn order, you're playing against a couple a couple other proactive decks or even three other proactive decks, right? Then you might have to try and police the table a little bit because God knows you're not going to be going off first, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to have some insane tur go off turn one or something like that, which you can easily do if you just rip that, like, god hand with, like, Dockside and everyone else does all their fast mana stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of the time, like, your average hand, like, you might just want to be, like, setting up as, like, the control player in that in that spot where you're just trying to stop the important things from happening and allow yourself to catch up and then combo off yourself. Uh, on another side of that, say you're playing... Um, so you're playing a stack stack, right? And specifically Blood Pot. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use uh, an example from one of my games where I had turn one Archon of Ameria, turn two Linvala, turn three Timna, and just go into town, right? Mm -hmm. I had the board was locked down. I was gaining advantage, and all I wanted to do the rest of that game was close it out. I wanted to be the proactive, fast like go off now deck basically now that's not as much with like mulligans and whatnot but in that scenario i pivoted from controlling the board stacking my opponents out to then being the proactive just go off now deck it's interesting because you know a lot of people would not frequently think of blood pod as the close out the game proactive style um, but you're saying your opening hand allowed you to also influence that decision of what you were going to be at that table. So yeah. this is not something that is actually static so much as it is variable based upon what your opening hand looks like. Is, would you agree with that? Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's I think, for for any time you use a quote, an exception to the rule, it, it's just it's a variable that gets put into the mix where you're like, oh, well... Now that this has happened, I get to do these three options now, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And you get to you get to adjust your game plan from there. 
and do a whole bunch of crazy stuff, which is a lot of fun in Magic, in all honesty. You get to, you know, break out of the mold and do something outside of the norm that your deck normally wants to be doing, which can yeah. be fun. Yeah. I've definitely seen, like, the the control player just, like, they're playing in, like, a grindy, slow matchup. And they just went, like, turn one, Vamp Tutor, turn two, Demonic Tutor, turn three, Thassa's Oracle, kill everybody. And mm-hmm. it's like, well that happened you know because like everyone else is like setting up like sylvan libraries and like mana dorks are getting online and stuff like that like they could just like just switch into this proactive game plan of just i'm gonna kill you all in turn three because i'm not winning the the long game in this one sort of thing so we've talked about proactive decks we've talked about stacks and control decks let's not leave out you know a good part of the meta which is our mid-range decks um what does the typical mulligan for your typical timnathrasios plan look like on average uh this is a mike question not a zach question (laughs) (laughs) let's go ring up mike hey mike i need you to come in on the podcast Hey, Michael, I got a question for you. <laughs> I got a question for you. Um, uh, tur- turn one, Dockside. <laughs> Apparently, it's not Tim Nathrasios anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh... We've already broke the norm. Okay, good <laughs> We've job. We've already broke it, yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, man. Okay. So, mid- mid-range decks, I don't have a whole lot of um, experience playing. But it's mid-range. You know, you just want to, like, I-, I assume you just want to keep some, like, value engine hand. A way to interact, a way to help develop your game plan, really. Um, it all depends on what you're playing. So, like, uh, I know Mike has played a lot of uh, Timna and Thrasio, so they're trying to get, like, Thrasios or Timna online, control the board, and then eventually, like, get, like, uh, was it a Seedborn Muse out or whatever, and just launch sure. themselves into the stratosphere or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so, I guess, like, mid range hands are, like, generally pretty flexible. If I'm really, really thinking about it, because they get to keep a wide variety of stuff uh, just because, like, they get to be, like, in the in the middle of everything. They're not trying to go too fast. They're not trying to go too slow. They're, you know, trying to interact at key points while also just getting these value engines online. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, like with any deck, though, you can be pretty aggressive with your mulligans. But I don't mm-hmm. think mid-range decks, for the most part, are trying to go for anything uh, too specific. You know, they're trying to, like, just get a, get a solid opening hand. Uh, and then form the game plan around that more than already coming in with like a single narrow gameplay of like, all right, I want to, I want to add Nas on three and then went through breach or Thassa's Oracle or whatever. They're just like, okay, let me just like go like turn one bird, turn two, like something. And then like, uh, you know, get some value engine online and then like, see where the, see where the game goes from there and then, and then pivot uh so it's more of like i guess uh, what we call ad- adaptive is that even on the database anymore adaptive lists they they definitely drop those from when you're talking about the cdh decklist database they yeah they drop the concept of adaptive uh disruptive and proactive yeah. um but generally speaking a lot of times they kind of fall into one of those three general archetypes yeah i would definitely call mid-range more adaptive than anything absolutely just because they have they have so many lines of play in them they can go they can do um basically whatever they want really yeah um one of the things that i noticed is whenever would it, whether you're a proactive deck an adaptive deck or a disruptive deck will usually decide what types of cards you want to see a density of in your opening hand obviously lands goes without saying you want some sort of resource to be able to start playing and building but proactive decks want to have a, a exponential growth of resources this is when we're talking about things like mana crypt on zero or grim monolith on two that can you know help us accelerate and exponentially grow our resources to eventually do something like you said cast peer cast ad nos things like that whereas yeah. a disruptive deck is looking for a more linear path so they're looking for a certain density of cards in their hand that allow them to follow a linear path but their interaction levels are much higher so they'll keep more disruption based spells not not hate bears per se but like things like i got the t1 fluster storm in case somebody goes crazy or a mental misstep i've got the turn to uh you know maybe a bounce or a mana drain or something like that because they want to make sure that that person doesn't win turn two or whatever but mid-range i usually can see a lot of people trying to who are a lot of opening hands uh in mid-range decks have a certain density of value engines and usually a keepable one piece of interaction. Maybe they'll keep an abrupt decay or an assassin's trophy and everything else be a value engine. 
So if that yeah. one critical crazy thing comes out, sure, I can stop it if need be. But really, my game plan is to build my value engines up first and then eventually go for my end game plan whenever I'm in the mid game. That's what I've seen a lot of times in mid range stacks. Yeah, I, 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 w- I would agree with that as well. Yeah. And by by mid range decks, I mean, that's all I've ever seen Mike ever do ever. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny. It's so funny. <laughs> Looking at you there, Mike. <laughs> you, you can cut that if you want. <laughs> or you can leave it. It's fine, too. <laughs> oh, wait, what? <laughs> uh, who, who do I care? Look at my hair, dude. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Another thing that I want to talk about is how aggressively you can go down in your mulligans also depends on what you want your deck to accomplish. And the example that I want to give here is Goto Bandit Warlord. It's a pet deck of mine. I absolutely love it. And you can win on a mull to three in that deck. That's right. You can mull down to three cards and win that game because its plan and its focus is so singular and the cards that you have in this deck lend itself so heavily to that strategy that you can afford to mulligan so much more aggressively than, let's say, like we said earlier, a control deck that needs to keep a good balance of resources, disruption, and lands. Godo doesn't care about that. Godo doesn't play a disruptive plan. It can get clear things out of the way, like, you know, an opposition agent or something like that that's disrupting its plan. But for the most part, really what it wants to do here is get to that mana to cast and resolve Godo and Helm. That's what it wants to do, and it is engineered to be able to mulligan a lot more aggressively as a result. Have you witnessed that or seen that in any of your experience with some of the stuff you've seen, uh, whether it be Blood Pod or other decks you've uh, decks you've piloted? Oh, uh, uh, I think that Goto is one of the few exceptions to the rule for for like aggressively mulliganing because like every deck can be greedy but goto can get greedy um whereas other decks you know they have to have a lot more resources to their to their disposal in every single game you know goto just needs to count to 11 every other deck needs to Mm -hmm. to do a lot more than that counting to 11 is easy uh when you're trying to ramp out uh Mm -hmm. goto plus helm but every every other deck really needs a lot more resources than that, so they can't get too aggressive with it. Uh, you know, you can't you can win on mulligans to like five and four, depending on your strategy and your game plan and stuff like that. Uh, it feels real bad though when you go when you go to like four four or lower. Really, you know, I, I suggest never trying to do that ever <laughs> if you can help it. You know, not not going wood. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but like mo- like most like. You, you need to, you need to find the right combination of cards in every deck, with it with you know just like flatline, and so basically you know you can get you can get greedy to a certain extent, but like once like you know it's like cool I found my interaction, cool I found my lands, I don't have any ramp, so do I keep going to try and find a combination of all of this, depending on where you're at in the pod? Probably not if you're already on like six. You know if you got lands and spells. Basic, like you know, basically, you know, like interactive spells. Like this would probably be a keepable hand for like most decks, most decks I'd say. But there, there are the very linear decks like Goto, where it's like this hand does nothing but interact. This is terrible. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, get Treasonous Ogre out on turn two and win. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just such a fluid thing with Mulligans. It depends on your deck. Pawn composition, where you're at in turn order, who you're playing against as well. You could be playing against like specific players where you're not playing against their deck, you're playing against them. You know, it's like the classic like poker thing. You don't play your cards, you play your opponent, sort of thing. Like, well, I played with, you know, Timmy enough times to know that in this position he does this every time. So mm-hmm. I can let this slide, sort of thing. Um and that's a whole that's a whole nother like metagaming thing as well. <clears throat> I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of people don't think about that. They don't think about actually seeing the face behind the commanders, the person piloting it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
everyone has certain tells. Everyone has certain play styles. Everyone has oh, yeah. certain approaches they take to the game. Um, playing with power is no different. We are a you know, we're just a group of friends who play, and we all have our distinct play styles. I can't tell you the amount of times everyone has passed it to Ryan because they <laughs> know he'll stop it. Yeah, just, Ryan. just yep. <laughs> Ryan always stops it. Yep, Folger just, always has it. Yep, Mike just, always just, has Dockside and Deflecting Slot. You know, it's <laughs> yep. just like that. You got to play around those cards because mm-hmm. you know they're going to have those specific cards every time without exactly. fail somehow. But that goes into the player. You know, you know that yeah. that person will keep a certain strategy in their hand over just what their commanders are. You've mm-hmm. probably played against the deck 50 times, so you know what they're going to do. But you also know that there's the variable element of who the player is. So knowing the player is going to also be just as instrumental in what you want to do when that player is trying to execute their plan. Are they a person who just, you know, you're not going to see them till turn five because they're just big on value engines and they don't care. You know, like, you know, you're not going to be able to rely on them or count on them. And if they're coming, if they're before you or something like that, you're going to have to pivot your strategy and your mulligan openers against maybe your super proactive player who's going to be like, he's on Goto, he's on Nas, he's on something. He's like, and he doesn't care. What anybody else is doing, <laughs> he'll always wants to be the one who combos first. Get yeah. that combo second at nonsense out of my face. I'm going to be first to the finish line, or I'm going to just die. There's no in between. So, a hundred percent. And this is something more along the lines that goes into playing with your local play group more than anything else. You can't really take this this bit of information and sit down in a random pod that you just mm-hmm. don't know who they are. You know, That's when right. you got your local play group, you know that, you know, this one friend always has interaction, doesn't keep a hand without interaction. You can, mm-hmm. you can assume that person's going to keep a hand of interaction, you know, mm-hmm. to stop everyone else at the table. So, like, yeah. in that scenario, you'll be like, okay, well, maybe I probably want to, like, against this player, just try and combo second instead of mm-hmm. trying to go first. You know, let, let Goto run into the into the trap, and I'll fall behind and, and you know, and score the touchdown, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's a super meta game move. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's an important one. I think it's one that people frequently overlook. Actually, for sure, for sure they do. I I know I do a lot of the times when I'm just sitting down to play. I won't I won't think about it too hard. You know, I was like, oh, cool, like soul ring on one with arcane signet. I don't snap it up. Whatever. I don't care. What I'm playing against. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> That was probably a bad example because that's just a fantastic, fantastic turn one play. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you care about who you're playing against with that sort of opener. <laughs> that's actually a really good point, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, obviously we talked about, you know, Goto and he can get super aggressive with his mulligans. Control players have to be a lot more conservative with their mulligans. Um, whenever you're looking at mulligans according to what your deck composition is, talk to me maybe a little bit more about card specifics. Um, when it comes to something like an Underworld Breach strategy, what kind of specific cards are you looking for uh, in your opening hand that you want to make sure that you're keeping? Talk to me a little bit about that. Let's, let's frame it in the world of Underworld Breach in this example. So you're saying Underworld Breach is the only game plan in your deck, and that's it's what the you're main one. Exe- yeah, it's the, the main, main one. game plan you're trying to execute. You're trying to execute Breach. Yeah, okay. So it, it depends on who your commanders are and how the deck really operates, to be honest. Like, okay, let's just take it from... Um, I'm going to use the example Kess. Uh, that's the deck I'll be playing at Tier 1 Con. See you all there. And uh, so basically, Kess wants to be doing a bunch of different things, and Breach is one of them. It could be one of the main strategies. So, for instance, say I have like, um, say I have like turn one, like so, say I have like turn one Genso Cavern for Mystical Tutor, right? I'll probably tutor up Wheel of Fortune over Time Twister in that deck because I want to fuel my Underworld Breach later on. I may not have Underworld Breach in my hand, but I can build my game plan towards getting an Underworld Breach. You know, so, like, you, you make several actions. You can make, like, your mulligan actions, like, okay, turn one, gemstone cavern, you know, get get wheel, and then go land crypt or, like, land mox diamond and then wheel away the rest of your hand. And then you've filled your yard up with, like, four or five cards for your breach later on. 
and then you can move your game plan on fr- from that so- mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, so in the, in this, I guess in this particular instance, like you want to try and keep cards that synergize well with Wheel of Fortune. Uh, who's Darcy? What's the? It's not Darcy. It's like the acronym for it. The Dragon, Dragon Lake, Rage, Channel. Dragon Rage Channeler. Yeah. So I actually up until this our our Patreon meetup. I didn't really like think about the implications of surveilling one on every spell for Underworld Breach. And I'm over here looking at Sean being like, dude, you filled your graveyard up with zero effort. And then he yep. goes, Underworld Breach, and I'm like, rut row reggy. Like, we can- <laughs> yeah. he's got like nine spells in that in that yard, and I can't stop any of this. That's right. Yeah, and so you can go to like the deck building along the lines for that as well. So the the thing about Commander, though, and like most CDH decks, CDH decks, is that most decks have like multiple avenues to victory, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever's in your opening hand, you don't just, like. I, I don't think generally you want to be hardlining specifically for one exact way to win because somebody could like say you want to do Underworld Breach stuff, and somebody goes Rest in Peace, and you're like, well, I can't do that anymore unless I get rid of Rest in Peace, and then have to like start everything all over again, mm-hmm. right? So you want to like keep like your opener hand opening hands can be like. They could be, like, really insane, and, like, you're just like, okay, I guess add Nos on two and then do whatever I want, cool. Or it can be like, well, I have a bunch of, like, value stuff, and I have a Demonic Tutor and, like, a Thassa's Oracle and, like, an Underworld Breach in my hand. So, like, what direction do I want to go? I can, you know, go, like, turn one rock, turn two, see what see what else does, maybe play, like, a Ristic Study or something, mm-hmm. and then develop your game plan from there. You know, whether or not you want to go for the Thassa's Oracle line or the Underworld Breach line. Because both of those are both those options are open to you with with that sort of hand. Uh, so I know I said this before, mulliganing is like really fluid and it's really hard in my opinion. It's really, it's really one of the most difficult decisions in the game is, is keeping your opening seven, yeah. uh, especially if you're trying to like really meta game it, playing against your opponents, playing against you know taking uh, pod composition into play into account plus turn order taking everything into account your mulligan decision is actually like i think pretty difficult um de- also depending on the strategy you're trying to employ it gets easier with the more like i'm gonna say quote like simpler the strategy you know goto or like uh trying to add nos off super fast or some some super like proactive game plan your mulligans are a little easier in that regard but when you start trying to play control and stacks then you gotta really you know crunch the numbers if you will and trying to figure out what you should keep, what you should throw away, what's good, what's not, th- that that sort of thing. One of the advantages that playing with power has is the ability to get a retrospective of frame by frame of exactly what we did and what we didn't uh, do in a given game because we record our games. So we have a luxury of being able to analyze our plays slash play mistakes, if you will, of which there are plenty, uh, and decide, you know, and see and learn from what those are. So watching gameplay a lot of times, even if it's not you playing, can actually help you out a lot. Frequently, uh, people will kind of gloss over the opening hand sections of a lot of gameplay videos, but I implore you to actually take a closer look at that um, and see what certain people did and how it ended up working out for them. Did the person sitting in fourth place in turn order actually have his turn one Mystic Remora pay off? Did it or didn't it? Um, taking a look at that and seeing those opening hands can be very instrumental. And going to what we had said earlier, a lot of times we see ourselves, uh, you know, looking at ourselves only in one dimension. What's my plan? What's Godo doing? That's what a lot of people, you know, use as a simple deck or whatever. It's very complicated for those of you who don't know. You just never played it before. I'm just <laughs> kidding. It's I'm just kidding. It's super simple. But... Um, but really what it is is that you actually a level up moment is really thinking about it beyond just what's my strategy it's what's that person's strategy what's my turn order going to affect my strategy you know those types of things are truly the level up moments and it's not like we can just go out here and say this is what you do if you're on nas this is what you do if you're on stacks we wish you could do we wish we could tell you guys that you know, we wish we could have a podcast episode be super easy like that. But unfortunately, this game is too complicated and there's too many variables for us to just go say, okay, with your proactive deck mulligan this way. You know, we, we, we just can't do that. It's, it, it's too difficult. 
Um, but really what helps level up is understanding those additional metrics that people don't frequently think about. It's where I am in turn position. You know, where, where's my seating position? Who am I against? You know, and that's from a commander perspective as well as a player perspective. Understanding those things is so important and you'll find that your mulligan decisions will start to evolve and adapt. And also the, the getting greedy part, the free seven, you know? If you find an average opener, if that opener's not great, ship it back. You know, ship it back for a better one, you know, because it's free. There's no downside to seeing a second seven. So absolutely go out there, think about these extra metrics, get a little greedy with your mulligans, and do all of those types of things. And you are going to get better hands, better mulligans, and better wins because of it. So there's one, one last thing that I want to talk about, and that is something that has always kind of been on my mind, and that is Gemstone Caverns. So Gemstone Caverns is a legendary land that reads, if it is in your opening hand and you're not the starting player, you may begin it with it on the battlefield with a luck counter on it. If you do, you exile a card from your hand. You can add color, you can tap to add colorless, or if it has a luck counter, you tap to add a mana of any color. So Gemstone Caverns is awful <laughs> anywhere but your opening hand. Here is the here is kind of the question slash level up moment that I implore to you, Zach. Let's say that you mulliganed to six. You're not going first in any of these examples, okay? You mulligan to six, and you have a gemstone caverns in your hand. What do you do? Do you ship it back and go to five? Do you uh, keep it and keep the gemstone? Do you use gemstone as the London? Is, the, what, is that what you ship to the bottom? Talk to me a little about the strategy when it comes to gemstone caverns. Oh, this card is a cruel mistress of a card. <laughs> it really is. Oh, yeah. So when it comes to your specific scenario here, it all depends on what else is in your opening hand. Are you able to make up the card deficit that Gemstone Cavern gives you? Are you not able to make it up? If so, then you probably want to ship Gemstone away if you can't make up the card deficit or take advantage of the fact that you're accelerating on mana. Now, if you get to go gemstone into, like, land, crypt, wheel, that hand's insane. Because you mm -hmm. just went from, you basically got to put out two pieces of fast mana, refill your hand, and disrupt all of your opponents. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go, like, say, like say you have, like, a Sylvan Library in hand, that's a, it can be a little riskier. Not so much anymore now that Hole Breacher doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because you don't have to worry about it ever turning off your library too much anymore. So, like, if you go turn one, like, Library or Dark Confidant, and you're making up that card deficit, then, yeah, keep that hand all day, usually. Uh, it's just all about whether or not you can you can take advantage of, of accelerating and losing a card as well. Now, if you're on, like, you know, the First Sliver or some uh, Food Chain deck, right, and you get to just exile, like, a Squee for free, basically... Mm. That is yeah. just fat stonks right there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> then gemstone's the best card in your opening hand, you know? You get to you get a dead card out of your hand, basically, into exile. Use it later on when you're trying to combo off. And, yeah. Now, when you start getting to lower numbers in your hand, say when you're, like, on five, I almost always ship gemstone back. Mm -hmm. Unless I can go turn one wheel. I always ship it back. The card, de the card deficit is just too much. Same with like, same thing with Chrome Mox and like Mox Diamond. Those, those mm -hmm. type of cards where you have to pitch, you have to pitch something to them. I those are almost always the first cards that I mulligan away when I go to you know six or, or five or lower. Um, sometimes six, sometimes not. Depends on what else is in the hand, of course. You know, Mox. If you have like an excess of lands, Mox Diamond's awesome, right? You know. That sort, that sort of thing. Chrome Mox is a, also a cruel mistress because it takes a real card away from your hand. Mm -hmm. um, but these, these type of effects are, you know, this is a double-edged sword for a reason. You know, they, they can accelerate you into a sweet, fast game plan, but they also take cards away from your hand, which are very valuable, especially in a game of CEDH where every card matters. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so what you're saying is the... The payoff for Gemstone Caverns needs to be worth its downside. 
So you're going to go down to six, so you're already Londoning one away. You're going to play Gemstone and get rid of another card. So that puts mm-hmm. you at four, effectively. You're yeah. starting with a four-card hand and a Gemstone Caverns on the battlefield. Um, yep. Now, I've seen people do things like uh, they will keep a Gemstone Caverns because they can turn zero Tutor. I've seen that before, like a Vampire Tutor Worldly Enlightened or something. Yeah. Um, and I've seen them do things like grab a Bloom Tender, a Sylvan Library, or something like that that allows them to get out faster. Um, and But you're saying that the payoff needs to increase the more you go down uh, in your London. Yeah, especially if you're trying to do those turn one tutors, the Vamp, Mystical, Enlighten. All of those tutors put you down a card. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're not, you're not one for one like a Demonic Tutor. It goes to the top, you're down a card, and then you draw for turn. So, especially in those scenarios, you need to make sure that, that whatever you're doing works. It has to pay off. Otherwise, you're going to be at such a deficit at the table where it's going to be extremely difficult for you to crawl back into that game. Mm-hmm. But the upside to being able to do these very powerful plays early, out I think, outweighs that deficit that you get. You know, you don't see Gemstone Caverns too often in 1v1 formats. Mainly because, you know, it's 50-50 or whatever, whether you're on the player draw. Uh, but going down a card is very real. Chromox is a very real downside on a card. You know, pit, pit, exiling a card. and Even though it's like Band of Modern or whatever, it's still a very real cost. You don't see it in like every Legacy deck. You know, even though like you see it in every single Commander deck, uh, CEDH deck. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. going down a card is not as detrimental in CEDH because you get your Commanders... You have access to even more broken cards than Legacy does, mm-hmm. which is just a it's a silly sentence that like I don't think I ever really think about until like you say it, you know, yeah. Like, um, so like you get to these more powerful plays, so going down a card is not as bad. But when you're already on a mulligan to like five, it's a very real cost because you can't pitch your commanders. Unfortunately, I've no. tried; it doesn't work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried it, yeah. <laughs> no, I, ser- I I seriously got my commander in my hand, and this is before I even, like, knew Adam. He was a judge down at the LGS, and I'm like, all right, I got my commander in hand. He's like, good job. And I'm like, I cast Chromox, imprint it. Can I put it back to the command zone and still tap it for mana? He's like, that doesn't work. And I'm like, this game sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, so, yeah, I think Gemstone Caverns is always that kind of, like, yeah, that wild card when it comes to mulligans because how, you know, like if you've got a really good, if you've got a really good six and one of them's, a, you know, gemstone caverns or if you've got, you know, you're on a mold of six and one of the cards in your seven is a gemstone caverns and you don't have a payoff for it. Like, you know, you might want to consider just putting that one to the bottom because you're going to have mm-hmm. your card quality trade off is going to be too great. Um, now I can see a lot of times people will pitch it uh, in order to get a turn one Thrasios, because they can make up for it. But that, once again, goes into the advantage engines you're talking about. Exactly. So. And you don't always have to pitch a card to Gemstone. You don't have to reveal it. You can just play it as a land if you need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I suggest not. Yeah, but... that's a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never yeah. seen it happen, but that's an option you have. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and with that, we are going to wrap it up. Big thanks to our sponsors, TCG Player, Dragon Shield, and support from viewers and listeners like you over at Patreon. Also, be sure to come find us at Tier 1 Con this upcoming August 13th through the 15th. Absolutely, and really looking forward to meeting everyone there. Please come out, support Tier 1 Con. We can't wait to play with you all and meet you all in person. And with that, we are going to wrap it up for this episode of the podcast. So tune in next time when we talk about our favorite format and our favorite game, Magic the Gathering. Thank you so much for listening and watching, and we will see you next time.